Mesdames et messieurs, voici les lauréates du prix L'Oréal UNESCO pour les femmes et la science 2017. Un nouvel espoir au Moyen-Orient, une nouvelle ère pour la médecine, et peut-être même pour nous tous, un nouvel âge. Une des clés de cette évolution est le fruit des recherches de notre dernière intervenante. Il s'agit de matériaux multiféroïques. Yeah, so multiféroïques sont certainement un candidat pour plus de miniaturisation des devices. And perhaps more than the miniaturization, the driver is that they would use an awful lot less energy than conventional devices that we have today. Alors comme ça, ce mot ne vous dit peut-être pas encore grand chose. Pourtant, ça pourra peut-être vous changer la vie. Pour vous l'expliquer, voici celle qui a pu non seulement prouver leur existence en théorie, mais qui, avec l'aide de ses équipes, a inventé et mis en place les techniques permettant de produire ce matériau de demain. Voici la directrice du département théorie des matériaux à l'école polytechnique fédérale de Zurich, le professeur Nicolas Spaldin. Thank you, Alexandra, and good evening, everybody. From the Stone Age to the Bronze Age to the Iron Age, every major advance in human civilization has been driven by developments in materials. So much so that we name our historical eras after the materials that dominated their times. Today, we often say that we're living in the Silicon Age because silicon forms the core of the microelectronics that enables much of our modern way of life. Not only our computers and our mobile phones, but transportation, automation, communication, the list is endless. And over the past decades, we've improved the quality of silicon devices to an astonishing extent, enabling, for example, the transition from, from old desktop computers to sleek smartphones with amazing functionality, all with the same material, silicon, at their core. But this silicon revolution will soon be forced to come to an end. We start to run into fundamental physical limitations set by the size of the silicon atoms that make up the material. And this means that the steady march towards lighter, faster, cheaper products with more and more capabilities can't continue, at least within our current framework. Now, you might say, well, that's fine. The controls on my phone are already smaller than I can see without my reading glasses. But there's a deeper problem. Worldwide use of microelectronics is expanding so rapidly that by most projections, half of global energy will be consumed by information technologies within a couple of decades. And this is not sustainable. So we need to take the step beyond the Silicon Age And to take that step, we need a new material. Without a new material, we're stuck in an energy bottleneck for human progress. And as a material scientist, my job is to develop that material. 20 years ago, I asked myself a question. Why are there so few magnetic ferroelectrics? 
Now, that might not be the question that keeps many of you awake worrying at night, but as soon as I'd asked myself why there are so few magnetic ferroelectrics, finding the answer became somewhere between a passion and an obsession for me. And what I discovered was really very simple, that the kinds of atoms that make good magnetic materials, that make magnetic dipoles with north and south poles in the material, have different chemistries from atoms that make good ferroelectric materials. In a ferroelectric material, rather than having magnetic dipoles, one has electric dipoles with positive and negative charges. But what I was also able to show was that there's no fundamental reason why electric dipoles and magnetic dipoles should not coexist. And so, Armed with this knowledge that magnetic ferroelectrics are at least in principle possible, my collaborators and I were able to develop an entirely new class of materials called multiferroics, which really are magnetic and ferroelectric. We did this in two ways. By designing new materials which contained in the same compound magnetic and ferroelectric atoms, like the bismuth iron oxide on the left, and by designing new crystal structures that trick or force magnetic atoms into becoming ferroelectric, like the yttrium manganese oxide on the right. So why is this important? Well, magnetic materials are currently the, the kind of sister to silicon in many of our technologies, where silicon processes the information, magnetic materials remember it. And in particular, magnetic materials store information in the orientation of the magnetic dipoles, north up, south down, or north down, south up. And these represent the ones and zeros of digital electronics. And magnetic materials are extremely good at this because these magnetic data bits can be very small, they're very stable, and they're rather easy to detect. But magnetic technologies come at a cost. To produce the magnetic fields which are needed to control the magnetism, one needs a very bulky component, which is also very heavy. Perhaps you once injured your knee and went to the hospital for an MRI, and you remember what a very large machine was needed to generate the magnetic field. And these machines to, that, make an, uh, that make magnetic fields also use an awful lot of energy. So now imagine the possibilities offered by a material that's both magnetic and ferroelectric. Multiferroic materials maintain all of the advantages of magnetic materials, but in addition, they can be controlled using electric fields. And electric fields are efficient, they can be made of tiny components, and compared with magnetic fields, they use vanishingly small amounts of energy. Our new multiferroic materials are poised to enable new device paradigms, entirely new ways of designing technologies. Perhaps we're about to enter a new multiferroics age. Now, of course, there's more to material science than microelectronics, and there is more to human civilization than information technologies. And developments in materials are needed to address many of the most challenging global issues identified by the United Nations. Issues of climate change and the environment, for example, need new materials that can deliver clean, affordable alternative energies. We need developments in bio and biocompatible materials, such as the astonishing breakthroughs we heard, heard already about from, from my colleagues, in order to support human health and in order to support persons with disabilities. And the development of these new materials will need the brightest, most creative minds of the next generation in order to frame the right questions and to figure out the answers. These are difficult problems that are not going to be solved with knowledge from just one branch of science and engineering, but will need perspectives from all backgrounds, both scientific and cultural. Teams of researchers, teams of young people that think in different ways and approach problems from different angles. 
So if we exclude scientists who come from countries that some of our governments find distasteful, if we build walls along our borders in order to keep them out, if we discourage an entire gender by letting them that they believe that they don't belong in science and engineering, if we don't collaborate with researchers that have different ethnicities or different nationalities than ourselves, then in my research team at least, there is nobody left. Nobody left to develop the materials that will make the world of tomorrow a better place. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is not my vision for our collective human future. Instead, I thank my family and my colleagues who never doubted that I belong here. I thank my brilliant, creative, and diverse research team who will solve the problems of the next generation. And I thank L'Oreal, UNESCO, and all of you who came here tonight for your support for women in science, and in turn, your support for a better future for humankind. Thank you. Thank you, Professor.